familiar portion of scripture, which is the life of King David. And uh, if you know of King David, you know there are two things that he's known for. One of them is what? What's the first thing he was known for? Killing the giant. That's right. What was the second thing he was known for? Falling to Bathsheba. Right? Falling to, uh, into sin. And so what ends up happening here in this portion of scripture that we're going to be reading today is we get to see the highs of David, his life, and we get to the very highest part of his life, I would say, when he defeated the giant, the beginning, basically, of the, his being king. You know, that's what started everything. And then we get to see one of his greatest downfalls, you know, and the payment of it. And so uh, the title, if you want to put a title to this morning's message, is The Giant That Beat David, is what we're going to be talking about here this morning. And, um, you know, it isn't, it isn't sickness, sorrow, suffering, poverty, or even pain, or other external giants um, that we can name, or that is going to give you the greatest trouble in your life. What's going to give you the greatest trouble in your life, one of your greatest giants that you're going to have to conquer is your heart. Amen? How many of you guys have turned into, at many times, your own worst enemy? Amen? You know, you're hardest on yourself. You're the greatest on yourself. Um, but many times, the things that we fight against are caused by us, you know, in our heart and what our heart wants, you know, for whatever reason. So we're going to talk about those things this morning. So in 2 Samuel chapter 11, um, I'm going to begin to read the story of, of the beginning of what caused him to face this giant that eventually ended up beating him for that time. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. Then David said to Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and she lay with him, uh, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come with him, David asked how Joab was doing and the people were doing and how the war was being prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah didn't go to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go to my house, eat and drink, and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also and tomorrow, and I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and he drank before him and made him drunk. And that evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but he didn't go to his house. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. We're going to skip down now to verse 26, where the story takes an end here. When the, uh, the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband, and when her mourning was over, she sent David and brought her to his house. And she came, became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Let's pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would 
First and foremost, remove me this morning. Allow your spirit to speak to your people, Father. I pray, Heavenly Father, for the anointing to fall upon the ears, the spirits of everyone here in this place, that we would get something out of your word today that we can take with us, Father God, and grasp a hold of this morning. Father, we thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do here today. We bless you, we praise you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So basically, the story in a nutshell is this. David was on his rooftop, and the rooftop was very high. He's looking down. He sees a woman taking a bath outside or a shower. He looks down. He sends a servant, has her come up. He knows by this time she already belongs to another man, Uriah. And uh, he ends up laying with her, getting her pregnant, sends her back, has the husband come back so that he could sleep with his wife because that's what he's trying to push, okay, so that his sin can be covered up. How many of you guys know that many times when we sin, we tend to try and want to cover it up, right? We do something, uh, we keep it a secret, or we go, we do whatever we're going to do away from where we know people, whatever the case may be, there's a cover-up, amen? And so that's what's taking place here, and when Uriah doesn't want to do that because he's a faithful man, not only to his king, but to his God, um, he says, no, I can't do this, you know, I'm a soldier, and right now I'm enlisted, and I'm not going to do what you ask, king. So the king decides, okay, if you want to be a soldier, I'm going to send you out. And if you're not going to lay with your wife, that's why he tried getting him drunk, so that he might make a different decision, right? Because sometimes we don't make the best decisions when we were drunk, right? Was that just me? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so this took place. He still refused. He sends him out. And he puts him in the hottest part of the battle to make sure that he dies to ease his conscience that she's no longer married, right, by law. She's no longer married. She's a widow. He takes her in right away to still cover up what had taken place. Like, oh, she's my wife now. She's going to get pregnant, right? So that's what took place there. So basically, if you look at it in a nutshell, the giant that slew David basically was lust. Amen? And in this part here, mainly it's lust of the flesh. But we're going to talk about some other things um, that took place here as far as lust goes. It's not just uh, sexual desire, but lusting for other things as well. So if we look at David's giant here, um, David's giant, if you want to understand the nature uh, of the giant that dwelled in David's heart, we have to go back before in uh, Samuel chapter 5, I believe it was, where we're told, uh, God's blessed David and established his kingdom, and he knew that this was a divine work of God, right? Because he was a shepherd boy, and he became king. The most unlikely of Jesse's sons became the king. You know, uh, the prophet came and said, no, not you, not you, not you, not you. You have one more, I know you do. And there's this little, the Bible calls him Ruddy, right? Ruddy, little the smaller guy, red hair, you know, doesn't look like a king at all. But how many of you guys know that God will use the most unlikely people so that he gets glorified look at the person next to you tell me they're not an unlikely person that god would use amen <laughs> god will use unlikely people that the world will say what are they good for but you know what god does use us he does use the unlikely he does use the outcast he uses the downtrodden amen he uses people like you and i so that he can get glorified amen so if you look Back in chapter 5, one of the things that was told to King David was that he was not to take concubines or extra wives. Now, you know, I still don't understand how that happened back in the day. You know, I mean, how many of you men here can only handle one wife? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But he was told that he was not to have concubines, extra wives. He was also told not to, to have horses and, and extra things that um, the spoils, basically, of the war that he had just won. But, and he did. He, he agreed to the others. Uh, the other things, he wasn't to accumulate wives. He wasn't a, to accumulate gold and silver. And he wasn't to uh, accumulate horses. But he only listened to one. And so this is when the, the giant came in, the giant of lust came in, and it seemed that David had a strong sexual desire, right? He had a, a lust for, for women. 
And so even though you don't battle with that, if you don't battle with that, then you lust for other things. We all lust after something. Some people for fame, some people for fortune, uh, prov- prominence uh, in a city. We, we lust after different things, things that uh, are not healthy for us. Amen? Things that are not good for us. We lust after many different things, uh, cars, houses, land, whatever the case may be, a position, you know, many different things that are not good or healthy for us to have. Amen? Because God knows who we are and why we shouldn't have those things. And there are things that God will tell you, you don't need that. You know, you may think you want something, but you may not know that thing, that very thing that you lust after will be destructive to you. Amen? So where did this giant come from? This giant came from David's own heart. So some of the factors of David's giant, like, are the same factors that we struggle with here today. The first one that caused David to struggle with this giant was he neglected his duty. Now, this was a time, according to Scripture, where kings were to be out at battle. And where was David? He was enjoying his kingdom. He's enjoying all the things that he had gotten and conquered. And lo and behold, he comes and he sees a woman while he's neglecting his duty. Because he's not standing at his post, something else came to his eye and caught it. Amen? You see, a lot of times that's what happens with us. It, 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 um, I pray for people, believe it or not, I pray for people that come to church. And I believe in the beginning stages of when we come to church, then our duty as a church-going person, first of all, is to get saved and, and to be fed. Be fed the word of God. Then to learn to feed ourselves the word of God. Learn to pray and those type of things like that. But then there comes a time where it should be a conviction of ours to also serve. Amen? To be at a post where we can go and say, God, you've done so much for me. I want to do a little bit for you. Whatever I have, whatever I can do, I will do for you. I have made myself available for you. And I believe that many of you here are very, very good at that. You're on track. You're doing well. But there are those who God will convict in this message for different reasons. Amen? And that's up to God to do. Not up to me, but it's up to God. So while he wasn't at his post, which is one of the first things that causes us to get off track, is we, we don't even know where our post is. We have to ask God. In the beginning stages of salvation, you should start asking God, what is it that you would have me do for you, Lord? What can I do to serve you, to serve your people, your kingdom? How can I push the movement of the gospel forward? What can I do? When we're not at our post, then we're looking at another post. Amen? We're looking at what else is going on. That's when we get time for gossip. That's when we get time for sin. Is when we're not at our post, keeping watch of what we're supposed to keep watch. That's what the Bible calls us. Did you know that in Ezekiel, the Bible calls us watchmen? I believe it's Ezekiel 33. It calls us watchmen. Amen? And it says that we're to watch out for God's people, and when danger comes or when sin is coming, when something is coming into the church, we're to blow a horn. Amen? To alert God's people to be careful. There's an attack coming. So we're called to be watchmen. You've heard the term, I am my brother's keeper, right? I mean, that's part of it, being a watchman, helping our brother out when they're struggling and so forth. What comes along when we're not at our post or when we're neglecting our duty is idle time. How many of you guys have heard? I think I mentioned that to somebody just this week. Idle time is the devil's playground. Hmm? Amen? Idle time is the devil's playground. When you have nothing to do, what is it that you normally think of? Amen? Is it the things of God, the people of God, the church of God, the word of God, God himself, or is it things that will draw you away from God? Amen? Amen? You see, David was in bed when he should have been in battle. Look at the empty chair next to you. Somebody is in bed when they should be here in battle. The only thing they're battling is that pillow right now. They're not here in church. Amen. They're not receiving from the word of God. They're not in fellowship with God's people. Idle time. 
Another thing that comes along, and what happened to David, was success came along. You see, mountaintop experiences are good. We look forward to those mountaintop experiences. But I'll tell you something. When you're on the mountaintop, you have to be careful too. Amen? Because a lot of times, you know, the Bible talks about that it's easier for a rich man, uh, it's easier for a rich man to enter the eye of a needle. Right? You know, the eye of a needle, uh, I'm sorry, it's easier for a, a camel to enter the eye of a needle than a rich man enter the gates of heaven. When it talks about that, I have a needle. That was a very small opening in a wall, a city wall. Amen? So that's what it's talking about. It's easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle. Uh, it was talking about a small opening where people are supposed to walk through. Right? And so we have to be careful in times of success because a lot of times we turn to ourselves for our success. We look at, I did this. Look what I did. Look at my accomplishments. And so we have to be careful when we're successful, when we triumph over sin, when we triumph over darkness, when we triumph over certain uh, spiritual attacks. We have to be careful. The devil is crafty. He has nothing better to do than to try and knock you down. He doesn't sleep. He's always at work. So we have to be careful when we're having some successes. Even in ministry, we have to be careful. David enjoyed absolute success and victory over all the enemies of Israel. And it was a great thing, but you're never, you, that's when you're most vulnerable, is when you're in that success mode. This is another one that I believe that happens to a lot of us. You know, a lot of us um, struggle with this, I believe. It's pride. David became prideful. When a man, even if he's king, can look down and see a woman bathing, send for a servant, and, he's, and the servant told him, yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's uh, Uriah's wife. David still said, have her come to me. He was prideful. As king who already had concubines, who already had a kingdom, he wanted something that belonged to someone else. He wanted someone that belonged to someone else. That's pretty prideful and arrogant, isn't it? I want when I want, who I want, how I want, whenever I want. That came into David's heart, pride. Now, it may not be to that extent, right? But pride is something we, you know, how many of you guys struggle with, with people blessing you? Does anybody struggle with people blessing you? You know what? That's pride. Amen? How many of you like to bless people? It blesses you, right? If you know that, if you're a giving person, you know that it blesses you. So when you don't allow somebody to bless you, you're robbing them. And that's something that we shouldn't do. It's hard for us to, to accept sometimes help. I'll be the first to admit I am definitely one that doesn't like to get outside help. I will do something myself, whether I'm tore up from the floor up. I will still say, I don't need help. I don't need Manuel, you know, I threw my back out a while back, and I was in a lot of pain this morning. And even Manuel this morning, you know, he says, you want me to help you up the stairs? And I was like, no, brother, no. I'm like, man, I'm going against my own preaching this morning. You hypocrite. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we do. We get prideful. And you know what comes along with pride? Arrogance. Arrogance comes along with that, right? We have to be careful with arrogance, thinking we're all that and a bag of chips and some salsa on the side, right, and a Diet Coke to go along with it. We have to be careful being arrogant. I got this. How many of us, that's our slogan, I got this. Rather than taking a more humble approach and saying, you know what, Lord willing, Lord willing, you know, I can do this. With God's favor, I can, I can handle that. You see, David had come to believe his own reputation. He believed that he was everything people said he was. Oh, you're the bomb, right? You're the best. And maybe you are. But we have to remember who allowed us to be that, who allowed us to have the successes that we have in our life. I don't know about you, but, you know, we, we didn't grow up with a lot of money, you know, and for us to be able to, to be successful people, and I believe successful people are people that go to work every day. They work hard for the money, no matter what they make. Amen? They work hard, they get paid, and they take care of their, their issues. They take care of their business. That's a successful person. Not by, based on how much you make. And, you know, for somebody to have a poverty mentality like I used to have, uh, you know, I'll tell you something. I feel like, like I've been successful. 
Like, God has done something with me and changed my mentality. You see, my mentality before as a drug addict was just to get high. And that, that's about as far as that would go. I didn't care about pleasing other people, pleasing my wife or my family. My, my priority was me. For God to change that mentality in my life to where it's about my family now, it's about my God first, which helped me with my family, which helped me have a career that I could spend well over 25 years doing. Amen? That was the grace of God, the mercy of God. But he had to change my mindset. Amen? I had to not be arrogant any longer and worry about myself and what I could do for me, but I had to worry about other people and worry about my God and what he wanted me to do in my life. You see, he enjoyed his celebrity status. You know, he enjoyed this celebrity status. If you can remember the beginning, before he was even king, the people were crying out about David. Well, look, at Saul kills his thousands, and David kills his ten thousands. So can you imagine David getting exalted higher than the king himself? Hmm? And he's thinking about this like, I'm the man. He says he's the man, and he's got the title, but I'm really the man. And then it came into pass where he actually became the man, right? So you can imagine by this time he's a little puffed up. And a lot of times we have to be very careful with pride and with arrogance because we get puffed up and we forget who really is the one who should be getting the glory for the things that we do. And it's God. Another thing that happened with King David at this time was he neglected the spiritual man. You see, remember, the Bible throughout talks about David as being what? A man after God's own heart, right? But that began to be in neglect when he started looking at himself as king rather than looking to the king of kings, his king. You see, he was the man number one right there at this time in Israel, but there was still someone above him. There's still somebody above you. There's still somebody above me. And that's the king of kings. The king, you know who my pastor is? Him. He's my pastor. He's my preacher. He's my deliverer. Not that I don't listen to men of God that are more experienced. I do, and I love that. But I consider him my pastor, my boss, my king, my savior, my deliverer. Amen. He's my everything. And when I make him my everything, then everything here gets taken care of. If he's not one number one in your life, then what is or who is? Amen? You see, you start to neglect uh, the spiritual man or woman in your life. That's the beginning of a downfall. Amen? We need to understand that here is the truth, that David's giant was something that he allowed to thrive in his own life. He could have prevented what happened had he taken the proper steps. Right? Right? Now, I don't want to be too hard on David because there's times when we're guilty of feeding our own giants, right? You know, we can't look to him and say, oh, my God, what a horrible person, you know, this and that. But, you know, I've, I've heard of this analogy before, and I, I think it's a pretty good one, is you have to understand that there's a, a fleshly side of us and a spiritual side, and you have to, you have to call those uh, two different pit bulls, right? And one pit bull here is the flesh, and the other one is the spirit. The one that's going to survive is the one that you feed. Amen? What's going to survive is what you feed, what you pour into. Because the other one should be dying of, uh, it should be a, a, a anorexic, if anything, right? Our fleshly side should be anorexic. Because we don't want to feed into the flesh. I mean, we've heard all these different things, neglecting duty, idle time, success, pride, arrogance. You know, those are things that we need to, to take away from our flesh. That we, man, I don't know about you guys, but we, we fight the flesh constantly, every hour, every minute, every day, physically and spiritually, right? David's giants are the giants that we, we, when we think about it, a lot of these giants that we fight, they're not from the outside. They're from in here. They're from here, and then they go to here, right? When we have a heart issue, we have a thought issue. If you sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. And then a character is not easily broken. You know that if you're in a long-term relationship, 
that somebody has a character, they have a flaw in that character, it's hard to break that, isn't it? Because they're like, oh, I've done that since I was a little kid. You know what I mean? You know, I know I sleep right on the edge of my bed facing the opposite way. I've always done that since I was little. Whether I have, I have a California king, and I still sleep at the very edge, you know? And my wife, she sleeps at the other end of the bed, and usually it's like her foot or something on my neck or my back or... But even if I did want to turn over, you know, amen, <laughs> I'm just playing. But we take a lot of our habits from when we're little because that habit eventually became our character, something that we've done since we were small. You know, some people will never put down the toilet lid because they've never done it since they were little kids. They didn't have sisters or whatever the case may have been, Right? We take those things with us. So we develop a lot of bad character, uh, characteristics, and we bring a lot of those characteristics into church. How many of you guys still operate on Mexican time? If you know what I mean by Mexican time, usually we're about an hour late, right? It's kind of like, eh, you know, we'll get there when we get there, right? You see, I grew up military, so everything with me had to be at least 15 minutes early Still meant you were kind of late, you know, just in case it was traffic or whatever the case may be. It was a respect thing, I guess you could say. And so we bring a lot of those things into church. You know, I sit there in my office, and I look to see. I can see you guys, you know, what time you come in. Some people will wait even all the way past worship. I'm like, wow, you're missing the best part. Amen? You're missing the best part of the service. Worship. Amen? Amen? And I'm not trying to, to, to get on anybody or anything like that. What I'm trying to do is to help you improve on something that will be better for you. If you're here for worship, you're going to get the benefits of worshiping God. Amen? There's always a benefit when you worship the King of Kings. Amen? So David, his giant had power. And why did his giant have power? He had power because he gave it to him. Amen? Amen? Our giants have power because we give that giant power. Whatever type of lust it is you deal with, whether it's a fleshly type, a spiritual type, whatever it may be, that's because you give it power. You see, the enemy doesn't have power to ensnare you. He'll dangle something in front of you. Remember, Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it, right? But that's not true. He can't make you do anything. He can't. He'll try but he cannot. All he can do is dangle something in front of you, and it's your choice to reach out and to grab it. That woman was sitting there. Now, mind you, I, I don't think she's completely not at fault here. I mean, who goes outside anyways to shower naked, knowing that there's a second story or a fifth story or what behind, right? So she wasn't completely innocent of everything that was going on, but he still had the choice like, oh, man, you know, I, I, I can't look at that because I know who I am in Christ. He could have said that, but he chose not to. He fed the giant of lust. Here you go. Here's a morsel. And you know what the Bible talks about when we look at something? It says the eye is never satisfied. Hmm? There's a reason why the Bible talks about the second look, the third look, the fourth look, the fifth look. There's a reason for that because the eye is never satisfied. As we examine what happened to David, when he faced the giant of lust, we learn something from the power of this giant that, David, that, that exercised in David's life. Watching this battle can help us when we watch our own battles arise. So the first thing that this giant did was it had the power. He gave it the power to ensnare his mind and think. He could have left it at the look and turned away. But then he calls the servant, hey, come here. He starts to put a plan to this action that he's just taken, right? Isn't that what we normally do? We think something. Actually, it, it starts off here in our heart. Then we think something, and then the plan comes in. Amen? The plan. We know we think ahead of time many times. You see, David's lying on his bed. He decides to walk out on the roof just outside the royal chambers. And, you know, that's where the kings, they had these things because they would like to look at their, the city that they were, you know, lording over. So there's this woman. And he decides, I'm going to take a look. And the Bible says that she was very beautiful to look upon, right? So he took it a step further, and he sent. He sent. 
All David can do at this point is think about Bathsheba. He wants to know who she is, everything about her. His mind is filled with fantasies of what it would be like to be with her physically. The giant that has ensnared his mind made him forget who he was. Does your giant make you forget who you are? Do you know who you are? You're a conqueror. Not just any conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. Does your sin, does your sickness, does your illness overthrow making you forget who you are in Christ Jesus? I'll tell you something. With the pain that I struggle with, many times I forget to tell myself I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm set free. You know what helps me with this? If you're in pain, sorrow, suffering, or anything like that this morning, I want to tell you one thing. What God tells me, and he's so gracious in telling me this, he tells me just like this, my grace is sufficient for you. Hmm? And you know what that does for me? That gives me a peace that surpasses all understanding. Because I'm like, you know what, God? I suffered, had sorrow, had pain before I knew you. But now I got somebody standing in my corner, the divine physician. Amen? You see, a doctor can tell you something, and it may even be true. But you got to remember that there's the divine physician who says otherwise. Amen? Who trumps over that doctor's decision. You see, I've seen miracles time and time again where a doctor will say something, God says, no, that's my son. That's my daughter. And although I, I may allow this for a season, the joy will come in the morning time. Amen? The peace will come in the morning time. The, heal uh, the healing will come in the morning time. All those things will come in the morning time. And what that doesn't mean the next morning. Now, does it? But what he's trying to say is that there should be a hope or an expectancy to know God's got everything under control. And he holds the world in his mighty right hand. And you don't think he can handle your issue? I'm going to tell you something this morning. He's more than able to handle your issue. Amen? He'll allow that season. Uh, I was explaining to somebody a little earlier that when my son went through, through uh, cancer when he was five, uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me in my, in my serving God in these 25 years. It made me a rock-solid Christian. Amen? It showed me that I had a total dependency on God. The doctors were already shaking their head. No, it's not looking good. Say your goodbyes. Say whatever you need to say. He's not going to make it. I saw the eyes of my son dwindle before me as he lost his hair. I saw him get sucked up by the treatments that they were giving him. I saw, I saw, as a matter of fact, the chicken pox try and destroy him when there was no immune system. But you know what else I saw? I saw the grace of God in my life. Amen? I saw the grace of God. I saw the mercy of God in my life. The doctors were saying, have you seen your son? And I said, no. And I went into quarantine where he was at where I expected to see him on tubes and everything. And you know what my son was doing? He was playing basketball. And the doctors were scratching their head. I don't understand. Come on, somebody. I don't understand. Because it's not the doctor. It's not the lawyer. It's not the situation that has the last say in your life, people. It is our God that has the last say in your life here today. A lot of times we stop looking to God. We start looking at the situation. We start looking to sin. As a matter of fact, we say, well, you know, I'm going through this right now. I might as well just chuck everything out the door. Why would God allow me to go through this? You want me to give you an answer to that? There is no answer. Because God is sovereign. That's the only answer I can give you. He's a sovereign God, and he knows what it takes to get you closer to him. We may see it as a sick joke, but I'll tell you something now. Looking back, I thought at the time when I was seeing my son, at the time my only son, dying in front of me, you know, which is probably one of the worst things I think a parent can go through. You know, and to get the news that I was getting, to see the grace of God work. I came to a decision in my life when God told me my grace is sufficient. I understood at that very moment that God is able to do whatever he pleases. 
And I'm okay with that. It put a peace in my heart, a peace in my spirit. I said, Lord, whatever you choose to do, I'm okay. I'm all right. You've spoken to me. You've delivered me. You've set me free. And whatever you decide to do, I know it's for my best interest because you're my dad. You're my daddy. And you always have my best interest in mind. I don't understand, and I'll ask you when I get there if it's even important at that time. Why do I have to go through this? Amen? King David, he's struggling. And he didn't look to God in this moment. He looked to a giant instead. And he allowed that giant not only to be fed, but he allowed that giant to grow. Hmm? It's not the kind of giant you can just send away either because he tried sending away Uriah to get killed and he was successful in doing that. But there was still the matter of the pregnant woman, right? But we'll go on to that later. This power that he gave the giant, it had the power to also erase his reason. You see, when you allow yourself to feed the giant in your life what is trying to take you out, it's going to take away your reason. Your reasoning should say as a Christian, my God's got this. My God is able. My God is willing. But a lot of times our own reasoning and our own understanding come into play. You see, God's thoughts are not your thoughts, and his ways are not your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts, and his ways are higher than your ways. And although you don't understand this morning what you're going through, God will eventually show you later why it is you had to go through what you're going through. But what happened here with David is his reasoning, his understanding was taken away from him. He went from knowing what a good decision was to not caring what a good decision was. His reasoning was erased from him. When David asked about Bathsheba, he is told that she's the wife of a loyal soldier and that she is the granddaughter of one of his advisors. So she's not a stranger. She's close. She's family, and she's part of one of his uh, high-ranking officers in military. Okay? Because you would think, oh, it would be easier if he just, you know, this was just some random person. But it's not. It's a close relation in two different ways, an advisor and one of his soldier's wife. This should have caused David to stop the course of action that he was taking, but instead he pressed on. This is the power of giants. And this is how they assault us, right? This is one of the ways they assault us. First, they ensnare the mind. They take away all your reasoning. I mean, you know, people in the grip of lust or some other fleshly desire often do things they would never, ever do. You know, I've seen a backslidden Christian before do things that they never did while they were serving the God. And they're doing things that they never thought they would ever do. You know, when you fall back into sin, the Bible says that seven other demons will attach themselves to you. Hmm? It's not going to be bad. It's going to get much, much worse. You already know God. That's one of the things that makes it worse. Amen? It's better not to know the Lord than know him and try and deceive him. Amen? So gave, David, he threw all this stuff out the window. When they get in the grip of their giant, they lose their senses. They become intoxicated with gratifying the fleshly desires. When a look is allowed to linger, lust will be conceived. And when lust is conceived, sin is always the result. It's part of the plan. What happened here is this giant was given the power to eclipse even God himself. Amen? You would think that that wouldn't be possible. But a lot of times when we're doing something we shouldn't be doing, thinking how we shouldn't be thinking, you know what an eclipse is like, right? When another planet comes in front of the sun and you can't see the sun anymore. Can you imagine that? When sin gets in front of the sun of God, we can't see the rays of light anymore. We can't see the truth anymore. Only darkness is around. So he gave this giant the power to eclipse his God. David knew better. At this time, he's 50 years old. He's been king in Israel for 30 years, or 20 years, I'm sorry. He's a man of God. He's a mighty warrior. But at this time, in, in this place, reveals the truth that he was only human. He brings Bathsheba into his bed. He commits adultery. 
with another man's wife. He dishonors her, her husband, his wives, and most of all, he dishonors God. You know, when we bring and feed sin or a giant into our life, it dishonors God. And that's the thing we have to think about most. God, is this pleasing to you or not? And if we even have to ask that question, we already know. Don't you already know if you're asking a question like that, whether you're pleasing God or not? You already know. When that happens, you're going to find yourself doing things you never thought possible. That's why it's important that the giants be defeated when they first appear in their attacks against the mind. If we can stop there, he can't control our desires to move forward. When David killed Goliath, he didn't take any chances, did he? He got that sword, and he cut the head right off. He could have cut an arm off. He could have cut something off, but there might have been the possibility of life come after. And what we need to do with those giants in our life, we need to cut the head off. The very thing that caused us to look, to do, to act, to respond the way it wants us to respond. Our giants want us to respond a whole different way than how God wants us to respond. And we need to cut the head off of that thing so that there is no life left in it. It doesn't matter if you give it food after that. A decapitated giant is not going to eat anything. Amen? He's living. Or the giant has blinded him to the point where David has become basically a practical atheist at this time. He's throwing everything he knows about God right out the window. That happens to us when we involve ourselves in something that we shouldn't be. That's what we basically become, a practicing atheist. If we don't believe in what God has to say, what God has to do, what his word says, we throw it all out the window, right? He's living as if there was no God. The giant of lust is standing so tall in David's heart that it blocked the face of God from his view. David and Bathsheba enjoyed the pleasures of an illicit affair. As the Bible says, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. That's in Proverbs 9, 17. David paid for his moment of pleasure with a lifetime of pain. You know, I'll tell you something. I know I'm still paying for a lot of the dumb things I did as a kid, even as a young man. Jump off the roof. Okay. Didn't make it, right? Let's have a BB gun fight. Okay. Didn't move out of the way quick enough. Right? Silly things that we do, we pay for in the long run. <laughs> Amen? But it's also the same spiritually. The things that you might do will affect you later on in your spiritual walk. If you're leading a double life at home, are you the same man or the same woman that you are here at church? If you're not, your children are going to pick up on that. And they're going to think that a double-minded life is okay to live. But a life of sin, a life of destruction, and then a life at church and a life of servanthood is okay. But the Bible says that a double-minded man or woman is unstable in some other ways. In all their ways. Hmm? Not able to make a right or wrong decision. This is the power of sin. David got, forgot God, and if you give in to giant, if he gave in to a giant, then so will you. He was a man after God's own heart, right? He still fell into it. When the giant rises up in your heart, he's going to try and block your view of the Father. When this happens, you're going to find yourself doing things you never thought possible. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says this. You don't need to turn there. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. That says it all in a nutshell right there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a few seconds here to write that scripture down. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. First of all, we need to be careful how we look at others. That's a lesson we need to learn. How we look at others. 
We know adultery is wrong. But Jesus said that looking at someone with lust for them, you've already constituted adultery. Amen? The second look, the third look, the fourth look. You've already committed that sin here and here through this eye gate that we have. The second lesson is this. Be careful how you look at others. Some men look when they shouldn't. Some women dress to be seen. Men, you don't have to look. Women, you don't have to dress. Amen? That's the honest truth. You know, and we can't blame it on either one. We, you know, you blame both. There's a reason why women dress a certain way to be seen, right? But men, you have the choice of the second look or not. Obviously, you can't walk around with blinders everywhere, you know, bumping into stuff like that. You're going to see people. But and that's not the worry. The worry is the second look and thereafter. Amen? But couldn't it be with other things too? The second look at other things that we shouldn't have or don't need. Right? We have to remember that any kind of attention that comes into the church should be an attention that's drawn to Christ, to God, to the body of, of Christ. Luke 17, 1 says this. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Do you know what that means? That means don't be a stumbling block. I'll tell you something. If you're doing something that causes somebody else to fall or stumble, that's what this is talking about here, this scripture. Obviously, if you're an alcoholic and you go to somebody's house and they're drinking, that person's not helping you or doing you any favors, is he or she? They're causing you to stumble. They're not helping lift you up, but they're participating in taking you down. And that goes with a lot of other things, that we should not be the reason why somebody falls or stumbles. The way we dress, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we talk. All those things, we're going to be accountable to God for those things. The Bible says, woe to him through whom they come, those stumbling blocks. There was a problem with David's giant, and I'm wind winding down here. The problem David experienced with his giant is the same we all face, the, the way we face our giants. David fed his giant, and you know what? When we feed our giant, our giant is never, ever satisfied. He will eat and eat and eat until it's eaten you all up. Amen? Until it's gotten you to the point where you give up, you lost all hope, and you're hell-bound. David's giant led him down a deceptive path. David tried every tactic he could to get Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba. However, Uriah had more integrity than David did. Look at Uriah's response in verse 11. When Uriah couldn't go home the first night, David got him drunk the next night. David is using deception to try and cover his sin. Instead of stepping up and being a man confessing his sins to God, and dealing with the consequences, David tried to hide like a coward. Hmm. When David, when people find themselves under the grip of and control of sin, they try the same method. We try and hide it, try and cover it, instead of going to God with honesty. Man's way is to hide things because, you know what, sin will lead you down a path of deception. Hmm? One lie leads to another. You ever lie so much that you forgot your own lie? It was just being shy like? Because <laughs> she said an amen real quick down. You lie so much, you forget how the lie began. And then you catch yourself up. And then you get caught in your own lie. Because you're believing your own lie. Amen? It becomes almost like a truth to you, doesn't it? It led him down a deceptive path. It led him down a deepening path. When deception did not work, David settled for a plan to remove Uriah altogether. Get it out of the way. Bury it. He devised a plan to get Uriah killed on the battlefield and even sent the man back to work carrying his own death warrant. Joab ca carried out David's orders and would later use that same exact plan against David. Hmm? The messenger that he told to lie for him 
Chapters later, that same messenger did the same thing to King David. When we use people in our divisive little plans that we have, man, don't say nothing to nobody. And you're just like, and you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll tell people that we forget. They can't keep a secret. D don't say nothing to nobody, but, right? That usually is what happens, right, and how sin comes out. You know, they say for every uh, secret that you have told somebody, seven people know about it. I think there's a truth to that, right? I think that's God's way of bringing things done in darkness to light. That eventually happens. It's how sin works. Sin is never satisfied. It'll, it'll, take, it'll lead you the wrong way. It'll, it'll take you deeper and deeper into its grip. We can't be deceived by the, the giant that dwells in our heart. It's just a way of destruction. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. <laughs> That's pretty basic, isn't it? The way of the transgressor, or the person doing wrong, is hard. Lastly, it led King David down a devastating path. After Uriah dies and Bathsheba fulfills uh, her mourning time for her husband, David takes her as his wife, but David shows no remorse. It appears in his heart that he's lost any kind of sensitivity at all to God. That's what happens to us. When we are practicing something that we shouldn't be, we start to lose sensitivity to God himself and the things of God. We no longer have a heart for coming to church. We no longer feel convicted and not uh, reading, in our, uh, reading our word, praying with our families, ministering to people. We lose that heart because it just keeps chipping and chipping and chipping away. You know, it's kind of interesting to see that in verse 27, David said, sent and fetched her. The second time David said fetch to anybody in his house, was the first time in 2 Samuel chapter 9 when he said, go and fetch Mephibosheth from Lodab Lodabar. The first time David fetched someone to show love, the second time he fetched, had someone fetch was to show a self-gratification of the flesh. That's how he started to begin. Like the Bible says, huh? oh, how the mighty have fallen. Right? That's what happens with us. And it's a sad place to leave David in this state of mind here. But if you think of the story as sad, it's not. It's not even over at that time. That's just the beginning. David paid eventually for the sins that he committed. But God was still good to him time and time again. One of the things that I love about God and what you should love about God is that no matter what King David did, God still allowed him to come back and repent each time. And God will allow that with you. Amen? Amen. You've been struggling with something, you've been in fear of something, and this giant continues and continues and continues to bother you. Amen? It might even be a new giant that you're facing. And this giant, before, you know, uh, several years ago, I did a sermon called The Devil Goes Fishing and talked about the different lures, you know, and I talked about fishing. Or sometimes when, when I don't catch fish with a certain type of bait, I switch it up to a new kind of bait. And the enemy does the same thing. But see, those can be also considered giants in our life. That when we defeat one, a different one comes. You see, you've got it to where it's not a problem for you to come to church. It's not a problem for you to read your word. It's not a problem for you to minister to your family, serve. It's not a problem for doing any of those things. But the enemy will come in with a new giant and say, well, let's see if this works. I will knock you down one way or the other because he's got nothing else to do. And so there might be a new giant in your life now that you've never faced before. I've faced some giants this year that I'd never faced before. Amen? And at first, they kind of knocked me down a little bit. I've got to be honest with you, you know? No, I didn't go back out there and do the things I used to do, but, well, my faith was shaken, shaken. And I didn't know how I could do it. I, I questioned myself as a pastor. Amen? Should I even be pastoring with this thought, you know? And I want to tell you this morning, with God, all things are possible. All things are possible because we are more than conquerors through Christ. That strengthens us. And you're facing something here today. This giant is actually, it's not as big as you think it is. 
When you put God next to a giant, how big do you think that giant looks? The giant is big to you. You may be even looking up to the giant, but he's not worthy to be looked up to. The only one we should be looking up at is our father because his ways are higher than our ways. He's higher than we are, and his thoughts are higher than ours. Let's stand this morning. I want you to understand and take something home with you today. If there's anything that I can leave you, you with this morning, God is faithful. God is faithful. God isn't faithful some of the time. God is always faithful. His timing is not our timing. His ways are not our ways. Amen? If I could just have you just close your eyes this morning. I want you to think about the giant this morning that you're facing in your life. Whether it's a sin issue, whether it's sickness, disease, sorrow, suffering, depression. We've covered a lot of things this year that we hadn't covered in times past. And I believe it's because God is bringing in people with different issues. This morning you're struggling. And with, you're struggling with this giant. You don't know how to handle it. You think it knows how to handle you. The only one that can handle you is the one that created you. The one who formed you and fashioned you just the way you are. This morning I want you as you're thinking of that giant, think in your mind that God has slain the giant already. He's given you that giant so that you could bring to the altar, lay him at the feet of Jesus. Drug addiction, alcoholism, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Whatever the giant you're facing here today is, come and lay him at the altar of God. I can't express to you the importance of doing that even on a daily basis. It's something that we need to practice more every day. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Some people don't know of the giants they even face here today. Lost loved one. 